Hey everybody, it's Dr. Jensen. Welcome to CCJ 3701 Research Methods in Criminology. So I'm here in Turlington Hall um, working on this material for you. This is the lecture that hopefully starts to bring it all together towards the middle of class. So we start looking at why are we doing statistics? Why are we recoding data? How do variables work and, and what did statistics mean? Are we studying criminology? <laughs> it's easy to say why are we doing all this? So this starts to get after, you know, how this comes back to crime and criminology. And I think you'll start to kind of see how it all works. So we're going to start with the question, how do we capture and measure crime in our communities? Because it's hard to do prevention or do community policing or proactive policing or change laws and policies if you don't know what you're going after. So this is where analytical work comes in to actually show the picture doing the observation, collecting the data, and then seeing what the data reveals so you can make decisions on, on what you're doing. So I often bring up this crime funnel. Okay, we're going to go from kind of green to yellow to red in just a minute. But I often have students say, I want to do a research paper on crime. And, uh, you know, I, I, I want to study um, inmates or I want to study people who are arrested. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. That represents two different places in time, two different decisions that are made about people in the justice system. You have to make a decision about who is going to be in your sample and who isn't going to be in your sample, who you're going to include or exclude because of those decision points and what happens along the way. So just to illustrate that, let's look at the crime funnel. So this comes from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, part of the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. Um, they helped me create the crime funnel, but this starts to show you how it works. So if, if we take all crime, and actually we're just looking at felonies, all felonies, we have in any given year about 42 million felonies committed annually. Okay, of those 42 million felonies, we really only know about 12 million. Okay, serious crimes reported, meaning they're reported or made known to the police. Those of you in law enforcement know this is absolutely true. There's a lot of felonies that occur that never ever make it to you. So we only know about a little less than a third of the felonies committed, okay, because they're either unknown, they don't get caught, and we know why people don't report crime. Oh, it's not worth it. Um, I know the offender, the offender and victim know each other. It's complicated. Uh, they forget. They, they don't want to be inconvenienced by it. They don't believe anything can be done about it. So we go from 42 million to 12 million really fast, and we know about those reasons, and we've studied those in other classes. From the 12 million serious crimes reported that we know about, we have only 6 million that turn into a felony arrest. So a little less than half of those are made to be arrested. Okay, so we know that we have to have um, certain criteria in order to make legal arrests. Um, and we often cannot meet that criteria. We don't have suspects. Um, we don't have enough evidence to mandate the arrest. Um, maybe the arrest was illegal and it gets thrown out. You know, they flee. We can't find them. So felony arrests aren't as easy as, as we think they are. You have to have a lot of things in place in order to do that. So if the student says, I want to study people who are arrested, I said, okay, you realize you're only studying 6 million of the potentially 42 odd million people who've committed a felony. But if that's okay with you, you know, no problem. So we're drilling down into the funnel even more. From the 6 million felony arrests, we get 915,000, a little less than a million felony convictions. Okay, so from that 100%, we're actually down to 2.2% of those felonies committed. Only 2.2% turn into a conviction. And this is where people get a little bit frustrated with the justice system saying, oh, I don't like plea bargaining or, you know, the justice system doesn't work the way it should. Well, the justice system has some of the highest standards of any system in the United States. Uh, the highest burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Lots of protections for both victim and offender working against each other in an adversarial system. So that's kind of what it's going to be like. And we can take a whole class on that, right, on felony convictions. But eventually we get down to people sent to prison annually. So if the student talked to me about I want to study inmates, I'd say, well, you realize you're not studying as many people as you could be. Um, only 420,000 people are sent to prison. You must be convicted in order to be sent to prison. We know you can be sent to jail for a lot of reasons, uh, but in order to serve a prison sentence, you must be convicted. So now we're down to 420,000. So this starts to show you the decision process 
at work inside the criminal justice system that's really going to dictate your sample or the people that you can actually study in a data set. So you could get inmate data from one prison. You may have a couple hundred inmates to look at. You may have, um, you know, juveniles on probation. Uh, maybe you need to do multiple counties in order to get enough of them. So just because of this decision-making process inherent in the justice system, it's going to very much determine how many people we can study, how much data we can get. Um, and it's very tricky to try to figure out how it's all going to work. So one other thing you need to think about is what we call the unit of analysis. So are we studying individuals? Are we studying families? Are we studying uh, delinquent kids in schools or programs? Are we studying inmates? Are we studying... Um, neighborhoods? Are we studying agencies? Are we studying programs? Are we studying states? Those are all different levels of behavior and phenomena going on. So if we're going to compare state to state, the data are going to look very different. If we're comparing two counties or two school districts, uh, you know, then again, we're going to see differences. So you have to know how your data are organized, and that's going to really set up your data as to how it's organized column by column and row by row. So the single unit that binds them all together is what that information was collected on. All of this came from a state. All of this came from an inmate. All of this came from uh, a family. Okay, so you have to kind of go, okay, what's all this information regarding? That's how we get after um, what a case is or what a unit of analysis is. Okay, so we're going to move forward. Again, looking at uh, how to measure crime in the United States. So here we have a brief map. It's a county by county map of violent crime in the United States. So you could actually make your unit of analysis counties, but notice you actually see a lot of gray places in here. So at the time the data was collected, either this was missing data, it wasn't available, it wasn't provided, um, or there were some problems with it. So you may not have a full picture of what you want. You have to keep that stuff in mind. Uh, some people say, well, I don't want to look at just violent crime, which tends to include robbery, assault, rape, and, and murder. Um, maybe I'll only want to look at murder. Well, murder is going to have a very different picture. So this is the actual murder rate in the United States, same year. Now, we also have been taught in criminology that murder is an extremely rare crime. It's not very common. Um, most violent crime tends to be assault, okay, um, or robbery. So, you know, we're going to be more and more narrow as to what we can capture. Okay, so this is just a way to think about how we measure crime and how it all starts to get organized. So our primary sources of crime data, and you've seen this in earlier introductory classes, are the Uniform Crime Reports provided by the FBI, uh, the National Incidence-Based Reporting System, what we call NIBRS, the National Crime Victimization Survey, and Self-Report Surveys. So these are the main places we go, but you can certainly go other places, and the Bureau of Justice Statistics often does that. So just kind of keep that in mind. You can find a lot more if you go to that agency. That's a fantastic agency to, to start finding reports and data. So anytime you're trying to find a source of data on crime, you have to keep in mind each source has strengths and weaknesses. All will record yeah, similar trends regarding the characteristics of serious offenders, maybe when and where the crime occurs. Um, they are usually quite reliable indicators of changes and fluctuations year to year, so we like looking at them over time. But uh, when we do measure, we like to check for the consistent trends and relationships that we tend to see. So we know there's usually a relationship between gender and crime or, you know, men and women, men predominantly um, committing most of the offenses, um, and men also participating in the victimization at higher rates than, vic than women do, uh, race and crime, um, crime being committed uh, more by young people with the age and crime relationship, and then social class. So we know there are certain kinds of things we tend to see in the data, and again, we can have all kinds of class discussion on race and social class and gender and age, but these are things that, that we can kind of look for that'll tell us how they get represented in the source of information. So that way we can determine if it's going to work for us and be accurate. So let's look at the Uniform Crime Reports. So just kind of by way of review, it's a large database compiled by the FBI, um, where you have a little over 18,000 law enforcement agencies participating in submitting all their crime reports, um, arrest data, they submit other information too. Um, accuracy is a little bit suspect. 
Research indicates that less than half of all crime victims actually report the incident to the police, so we have to keep that in mind, but it still is a good source. This is often where the crime rate is calculated. So the uniform crime reports um, give you official data, arrest data, court referrals, police reports, prison records. Um, you get the demographic data um, on the usually the offender and the victim, race, sex, age, uh, the offense type, the location, uh, occasionally modus operandi. Um, and it provides data on the more serious offenses. These reports more accurately reflect some of those biases within the criminal justice system um, and incorporates varying levels of, of discretion from officers and, and agents in the system and negotiation. So we completely leave it up to police officers to determine whether an arrest is necessary, whether to start an investigation, and uh, they have full discretion to make those decisions. And uh, so we're going to see some of that reflected in the data. Race and crime, it'll be kind of reflective of some of the policing practices which influence reporting um, when we kind of over patrol minority neighborhoods. Um, so sometimes we can see racial minorities overrepresented in the data, so we have to keep that in mind. Uh, sex and crime, we don't necessarily get the best coverage in the male-female differences. Um, occasionally we see differences in reporting on whether the offender was male or female. Um, social class is kind of interesting. If we want to look at quote unquote bad neighborhoods, um, we don't really get social class. We don't, you know, ask the victim, and what is your social class on a police report? Um, but you can kind of can extract how well off they are, their, um, their status or their life chances um, by looking at their address. Um, and their education. So an address of an offender, maybe how much education they have. We can usually get that from prisoner data. Census tracts, where they live. And you can kind of crudely construct, you know, how well off somebody is um, based on, on some of those kinds of things. So it's not perfect, but it's close. Um, we can actually build variables that way when we have that information. Um, that's more recoding to do. Um, so official data, you know, tend to show some differences in social class, um, but because the the way we put them together is, is not perfect, um, I don't know that it's as meaningful as we'd like it to be. But we do see things like this. This is from Blau and Blau. They find that official data demonstrate economic inequality in profound ways where we have overcrowded areas, highly urbanized areas, residential instability, where we see a lot of police patrolling. Okay, so that's just something to keep in mind with the UCR. Okay, now we turn to NIBRS. So NIBRS, um, it's from the 80s. It requires police agencies to provide a brief account of each incident and arrest, including incident victim and offender. Um, so it's a little bit more wide scope UCR report, basically. Um, it comes from the Bureau of Justice Statistics to capture a more detailed spectrum of offenses, offenders, victims' property, arrest data. It gives you 22 different crime categories um, and 46 offenses. UCR only generally captures what we call the eight index crimes. Um, we do have some expansion from time to time on this, but the eight index crimes are murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny, motor vehicle theft, and arson. And we only get general characteristics, but in NIBRS we get a lot more detail, which is kind of cool, and a lot more collaboration between a federal, state, and local. So NIBRS, um, we, we've done some expansion since the 1980s, so it's a little tricky to compare data over time as to what we've seen with crime. Um, again, not the best coverage in male-female differences, again, because it comes from police reports, and some people don't report female crime as often as they should, um, or male crime for that matter. So we don't really feel comfortable trying to cover the gender relationship. Um, age and crime, we do show that, yes, we do see younger offenders in there, um, but uh, it's not necessarily the best place to analyze juvenile justice system offenders with, a, with the adult system. Um, there are better sources for that. Um, for race and crime, again, it's police reporting, so it's going to be similar to UCR, um, where we see overrepresentation and heavy patrolling, and uh, again, same thing with social class. But it does overall improve some of the accuracy of official crime data, and that's important to us, so NIBRS can be a good place to do some data analysis. We're going to stop here and pick up um, this next portion in the next lecture, so we'll see you then.